Um, so yeah, so this is what I'm going to, do you want me to wait for that? Yeah? So um, hello, hello world. Um, I'm going to talk about this. So I, what, what I do is um, I have a background as an artist, as a scientist, as I've been doing media art for about 10 years. I have an institutional background doing medical research in a number of different faculties and like pathology, environmental health, genetics. I'll tell you a bit about that. Um, and what I've been doing, um, started with this group. So I've got, that's kind of my art thing in the middle. And then I've got this uh, group here, the Open Science Network, which is sort of a public lab that uh, we built in Vancouver, Canada, in the west of Canada, yeah? And um, now that's been a physical lab for maybe three, four years, something like this, yeah? And a couple years back, I decided that um, once that got up and running and I had the group together for maybe eight years, I decided I wanted to start um, traveling and being, uh, trying to do this more and more in other places and thinking about the open science concept in different countries, in different locations. Um, that was Europe, North America, and then uh, about eight months ago, I, I went to Japan and then I started doing the same with Asia, yeah, and I've been going sort of from city to city, hey, um, and, uh, and exploring different places um, in, in Asia, and most recently, that led me to Shanghai, where there's a lot going on, a lot of activity, um, and that's, uh, that's a, a current lab that I'm helping, helping out with at Tongji University in, uh, in Shanghai, yeah, BioBuild Lab. Um, and so I wanted to, I thought Singapore would be a really nice place. Um, there's a lot of, I think, uh, a, a lot of shared culture between Vancouver, a place like Vancouver and a place like Singapore. We have the Pacific Rim thing where we're both, um, you know, cities that, that really live and think about multiculturalism, I think, on different levels, you know, um, and think about doing it, I guess, in a way that is, um, that, that is in touch with Anglophone culture, but isn't necessarily on center stage with it, right? We're not in New York or a, a London or something, right? But we're very much in that dialogue. Um, and I think in an interesting way that uh, so, some cities, um, not every city is, you know, and the American model is sort of one model. So I think it's, for me, it's an ideal place to sort of bring up what one thing that's behind all this traveling is that there's kind of what I'll call a weak multicultural model in Canada, right? We have people from all around the world and then they all end up speaking English and just kind of being not quite American and doing, you know, all pretty similar things. And the second gen syndrome is that you don't really want to know about your culture. You want to get to know this Anglophone culture because that's where the economy is, right? And I thought, well, you know, traveling and going to the places where I really am forced to engage fully with the culture and being in China is a good place to do that, you know, really good place. Um, you have to learn the language, you have to learn, it's not just, oh, there's a Chinatown or something, right? So there's a stronger form of multiculturalism, I think, that really forces us to think about what knowledge we're valuing. Um, and I think Singapore's in a better position than Vancouver in this sense, because you are neighbors. You have multiple official languages that are very proximal. We have French, but if you're in the Western Canada, in w the Western Canada, you don't really speak it, right? And then we have, like, lots of Punjabi spoken, and lots of Mandarin, and lots of all these, Hindi, all these languages, but most people don't speak them. Everybody just speaks sort of English. So being a little bit closer to a Malay speaking country and then Indonesia and China and it forces you a little bit more it's a bit like Europe they're a little bit better at learning these languages and really getting deeper than that weak cultural engagement yeah my basic premise throughout this is going to be that what the hack space does and what the open science space does is enhanced by this yeah so good empiricism good knowledge is multicultural Okay, it increases your viewpoints, it increases the perspectives from your looking at it, yeah? And I'll be returning to that. Um, so this is the basic thing. I introduce you to these uh, different groups. I'll give you a bit of background about me and those groups. Um, so like I said, I've been doing, uh, I did the medical research, I did the media art, and more and more what I've been doing is combining them, yeah? So I've been sort of more and more becoming a so-called bio-artist and a scientist artist. And in my projects, I have, you know, I work with computers and I work with other media and then I'm doing this medicine stuff. So I'm like, okay, how can I start to kind of try and bring these together? So those different poles I try to bring together in a practice that I think of uh, as part doing what a scientist does and then part doing what an artist does. And then things like education and the ideas behind things uh, become more and more important because they're a way I can sort of gel it, right? Uh, philosophy, you know, it becomes a way I can talk about it in the same frame. If it's a bit, of, a bit of a shift in the paradigm, that's a language I can sort of use, yeah? Um, 
and yeah, like I said, I've been uh, up until a couple of years ago, I was more or less Vancouver based and now I've been uh, in a number of different places. I was in New York for a bit, I was in Europe for a bit, uh, and now I've been here and I've been now in Shanghai for a few months. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's me. That's me. Um, really? Yeah, that's me. Yeah? Is it, yeah? Yeah. What's that? How long ago was that you? Oh, this. Okay, well, you know, the beard. It, like, you know, it's, it's, no, this is, like, two. You shapeshift out with the beard. <laughs> I, you Snapchat for the next month. Uh, yeah, 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 this. <laughs> customs and the the customs officer wouldn't let you pass, you know, I'm like, who the hell is this, man? <laughs> It's really true, actually, because my uh, all my photos are all without a beard, and I'm like, who? Oh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, I need to look older though, because I'm always I always look way younger than I am, and I still I think look younger than I am. So I'm just yeah, it's like at least I'm closer, you know. Most people like I want to look younger. I'm trying to look older, you know. Yeah, this is literally a couple of years ago, um, and it's confusing because I have a projection on my face, Adeline. Okay, I don't have green and red skin. I know it's confusing, but. This is the real me. Yeah. Yeah. He also was like, "Oh, you look different," because I have this weird photoshopped image with like green woman man skin, and yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, that's understandable. Um. So. So this is the Open Science Network, yeah. So this is the group in Vancouver, and as a group, as a collective, it's existed now for um, a decade, give or take, yeah. And it started when I was at UBC, University of British Columbia, the sort of big university in Vancouver, um, British Columbia being the province that we're in. And, uh, and then uh, I soon realized after a couple of years that it wasn't really working there. It just wouldn't, um, there, there wasn't the people and it couldn't extend outside of the university. Uh, so I sort of put it on hold for a couple of years until I, I and then migrated outside and I sort of it started again kind of more in the city. Uh, in the in East Vancouver, which is our sort of art artsy kind of alternative kind of space, you know, where you'd have spaces like this, right, that don't look so pretty but are amazing inside, right, um, and look really pretty too as you get to know them, yeah. Um, so so that's that's where it started to pick up, and then after a few years, I met Scott. Scott was a key person. Really, this was built with me and another guy um, who Adeline knows as well. Um, very different approaches, very different things. He's a very methodical, organized person, and I'm someone who just sort of can ramble in front of people, you know. And uh, and he's not. He's very quiet, and you can't hear what he's saying, and you know. But he's all he has all these qualities I don't have, so it's perfect. And we both have a science background because I had all these people who are like, oh, science, that's awesome, and they're like a poet or they're like programming Python. I'm like, okay, great, but we need actually some content before we, you know. So this is a difficulty. A lot of these bio spaces have all these like tech people that are interested, and there's all kinds of dynamic energy coming from tech that I really appreciate. But you need a bit of the bio knowledge to actually make it happen. So finally, I met him. This is already like five years in, and then we start talking. We do a few. We do a, a couple. Maker Fairs, we give this big talk at the Maker Lab space, and then we get a huge turnout. Uh, I, you know, I give a talk, we, 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 we invite the people back, and then we build a board out of that, and then we, we eventually build the space. Yeah. Um, so that's that. And then I already told you what happened after that. Then I started, um, I started uh, traveling. This is the place now where I've been at uh, for a bit, and we're, we're, um, I'm helping out. You know, we're in the process of doing the. Uh, the considerable paper paperwork that you must do in China in order to uh, uh, work there and stuff. But the dean wants me, and the head of this wants me. So you know, eventually I'll I'll, I'll get there. Um, so pending that everything goes okay so with Xi Jinping. Yeah. So to yeah, that's what they want. So yeah, yeah. That's they they said yes, we want you, and now here's a pile of things to do. Right. And I'm yeah, I'm like okay, great. I'll see you in a few months. Yeah. Um, so it's in process. I mean, I'm already, yeah, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm there and I'm, but yeah, like that, that's, that's the, they, they express interest, the dean express interest, and so I'm, I'm going through the, the steps for that. And I have to say, China is a place that, um, as I'm sure you guys know much better than I do, uh, it's a place of real contrast where there's a dynamism there and an energy and a, and a humbleness of the people. They're so genuinely interested. They're, they're um, really diligent about what they do, and they're really interested in new things. And then there's a structure that really wants to maintain things that are, to say it, uh, you know, to understate it, that are at odds with the American model and the global capital model, you know. It's, 
it, there's tension and they don't know which direction to go. And I think to give them completely the benefit of the doubt, it's hard. It's hard to deal with it. I think a lot of countries around the world don't know how to deal with this sort of weird globalizing force that, that, that America brings to the table, you know. And China's really trying, you know, and they're really trying with their own model. Uh, so sometimes it's amazing because they'll grow at a pace that I've never seen before. And other times it's, it's, it's sort of frustrating and stagnant and difficult, you know. Um, but it's an amazing experience for me culturally and in terms of learning about what open science can be globally. And I'll return to them and other places I've been around Asia um, when we, um, yeah, so we, we, we can talk about some of the, the details. There's a lot of places I could talk to and I just want to give you kind of some taste of, of, of the specifics. You know, like before here, I went to Tokyo, Hong Kong, to Phuket, to Manila, to Ho Chi Minh, um, and... Uh, there's different flavors to each place. And I think the one thing I'll say is that I really tried to see, will this model keep working? And I'll talk in general terms about that. What I found started to work better and what I think maybe are models that are too Western, you know, like that don't really translate well across economic boundaries, across cultural boundaries, yeah. Um, and this is just an example of the kind of exhibit I have. You can't, the, here I have like a food-based video game controller and then I create this sort of abstract interface. Um, so I bring in some bio, I hook it up to electronics, I do that. I grow things in a lab, I bring them into a, um, a, a gallery context. Uh, I like to sort of spin science fiction narratives about it. So sometimes I'll be doing these really crazy techniques. Other times I won't, but I'll say I'm doing even crazier ones. Um, anything that will sort of provoke the conversation around science within society, how it's working, um, how to democratize it, and also how to maybe defetishize this sort of ivory tower top down kind of, oh, science said this, I link this special article from nature, and now you need to listen completely, you know. Um, no, I think that we can each be critical, and if we don't do that, then we lose any touch with science. And that's a core point for me, is that economy doesn't equal good knowledge, right? Economy equals economy. Economy might equal power, but we really need to pay it. If we, we have a, a model that is about, um, that is about empiricism, right, it's not necessarily a model that's about techno capital, yeah. So that what what we have there, I think, is a um, you know the MIT model we can call it. You know, to be very serendipitous with uh, with where Adeline's just been, um, or and you could pick any sort of institution where the money and the type of equipment that goes with that is key to this type of knowledge, right? There's a lot of great things. Okay, I've already said that technology is is this dynamic space that brings about spaces like this. It's not just a reaction against. Um, the Craig Ventures of the world and the, 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 the sort of ivory tower innovators of the world. It's also thanks to, right? So it's a complicated relationship that I think we need to constantly rethink. At the same time, though, to just end at this idea that, you know, more money equals better knowledge or something is obviously bogus to me, you know? And to find ways of working against that, to find what is, what is valuable in the model, what is dynamic, what is leading to new questions and paradigms, and what maybe is just ending at an economic question, right? Um, and that diversity, I think, is really key. It's really key to being able to um, test how your model might work. If I can't take my model to Ho Chi Minh and engage in dialogue. I can't understand how this guy is weaving bamboo baskets and yet somehow I've got this molecular bio knowledge that everyone should have if they're doing biology properly, right? And yet he's working with trees in this complex way that I can't engage in at all. Right there we've, our model's fallen apart, right? And we need to reevaluate it. This is one way I propose we can do that. He's got empirical knowledge that practically he's evolved over time to build that. And I've got another empirical knowledge that maybe has more of the technical capital, but I need to abandon that in favor of trying to redo his experiments, learn them from, from that perspective, and then we, we gain what you might call a better knowledge of what the bamboo tree is, right? Maybe I have molecular knowledge and he has sort of this more constructive knowledge or something. Together, there's a better scientific model of what that plant is, what, right? What is uh, techno capital? So techno capital, there's two parts to that, right? One is techne or technology, right? So techne is a word that, so when, when Aristotle wrote about knowledge, if we translate what words he used for knowledge, he's got a bunch, okay? He's got like words that are close to like wisdom or like psychology, you know, and then he's got a couple that, that uh, are really useful for this kind of discussion. One is episteme and one is techne. And techne was where we get this word. Yeah, skill. Skill I think would be pretty close, right? It's applied. 
It's applied knowledge. So he calls techne when a craftsman, like this guy, this guy who builds the basket, or you know, when someone builds something, or they have, they can make a thing with it, right? So it's applied somehow. It's 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 a skill. It's a sort of a mechanic has it. This kind of thing. Episteme for him. So epistemology, if you know that word, and this is what translates the when the Romans translate Aristotle, they translate this as scientia, and this is science. Okay. So our word for science comes from what Aristotle. Um, in his, Aristotle's use was theoretical, yeah? So it was philosophy, really, right? Although philosophy, Sophia, there's another word that's more wisdom, right? Um, so for Sune is like practical, ethical knowledge, etc., right? Um, what is good knowledge, you know? And in his case, it's pretty complicated to figure out which is the best knowledge, right? He, he kind of likes philosophy, obviously, but, and he certainly wouldn't put techne on top, but it's complicated. He really depends on what you're doing, right? Whereas today, I, w I would make the argument that in the American model, we tend to favor techne over the other forms of knowledge, right? So that's one aspect of it. Um, the other aspect is that uh, is capitalism, right? Which is, I mean, we all we all understand what markets are and what commerce is about, and you know, America's kind of very commercial media driven ad driven kind of thing that both Vancouver and Singapore are able to keep up with, right? Um, Capitalism is a, a term that evolves from a, a certain historical moment in this commercial. Every culture has had trade, right? But, but the history of capitalism, when you get into economic thinkers in the West, they start to say, well, there's a point where trade reaches a point of sort of abstraction and of almost political kind of presence that we need this new word. We, we're not just talking about what they, what they called mercantilism, which they would store gold and they would trade, and this was early colonialism, or other market systems through history. But now we've got an abstract system where things like a stock market and um, the, the abstract kind of value of things is really important to keep it going. So one case, we were talking about Holland before, is that it starts in Holland, right? And there's other European countries that have a stake. Britain, obviously, very early on. Singapore's existence is, the, the Anglophone existence, is really based on that or that presence, globalizing commercial presence of, of, of England, right? So really there's a lot of capitalism at the core of, of how Singapore sort of has grown and evolved in relation to the West and in relation to, to the countries around them. Um, but, so it starts somewhere in Europe, but really the, the golden example is America, because by the time America starts applying the model and tweaking it and improving it in the 19th century, uh, this is the model that more and more has become the w what what is everywhere in the globe. You know, Britain had one that was had a lot of global presence. Not anymore, right? Britain is, doesn't really exist on the global stage. America absolutely does. You know, they have bases everywhere. They have media presence everywhere, um, and their model of capitalism um, is is sort of uh, really crucial. So that's that's sort of the broad stroke, right? That we've got a model of politics that has. As, and this is, this is one way to think about this, is that they start making, um, you start making policies that allow corporations more and more rights, right? This is key. So a corporation more and more can behave like a person, right? So you get less liability for people, so people will take more risk, because they're like, well, I won't lose anything. I won't get blacklisted. The corporation will, and then I can just get rid of the corporation and then shift it up, right? So legal changes in America in the 19th century, improving this and tweaking it, uh, is really important to them growing economically like crazy, right? The state protects you, okay? Yeah, well, this is the thing. Where does capitalism start? Absolutely in Europe, right? So they have these sort of legal precedents already in place. Um, and Holland, the, the, the Golden Age, the Dutch Republic, this is sort of one of, most historians tend to go there as their first place. But England picks up pretty quickly um, with the Industrial Revolution and after. Um, and again, America doesn't really exist at that point, right? But once well, America gets it. Specifically about, you know, limited liability corporations as being a legal person, legal right. person. Absolutely, it happens in Europe first. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and the LLC, I think that is particularly Britain, right? That that comes up with that. Yeah. I think. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, I mean, now you see it all over the place in America. But yeah, absolutely, it happens in Europe first. Scholars debate where and when. Uh, but the point is that now it's not just trade is this thing that's always going on that 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 you know the governments tend to favor like the priestly class or the warrior class or this kind of thing historically now they're creating more and more legal spaces for this commerce because they're seeing a value in how it can help grow the state right this is a key sort of part of it so obviously it's a complex discussion but there's something about technology and capitalism 
that in a highly American model, more and more now it's a global model. Right? Chinese model is capitalism as well. It's, it's another version like the winner take all. Yeah, I think one, so uh, one thing to say right away is that this whole, oh, are they really communists? You know, I don't, I don't believe it anymore because now they're just, one thing that's absolutely certain is are they trying to do something different and in tension with the American model? Yes, yes. right, yes, that's clear. So is Singapore, is Canada? Not so much, right? We're pretty much keeping open to, not to say that there aren't minor differences, but in China they really are trying to do something different. In the Middle East they're really trying to do something different in, uh, in Russia. So within that complexity, because is, like what, what is China's political system? Well, one thing's for sure, when you say that you're communist, whatever that means, and in this case, yeah, it means something pretty similar to whatever it means to be a capitalist American, to be free and to be you know, loving individual parties, whatever, right? Um, what is clear is that it's trying to say that it won't necessarily be completely open to whatever that model is, right? Um, so is China, it's the same with the Marxist argument. Oh, China didn't do real Marxism. They did this other kind of, okay, it's obviously different, right? Russia did a different Marxism. The real Marxism is when Marx does it in Europe. Right? And there are people in his time that do a kind of social democracy that's very similar to like the Scandinavian model now. And how a lot of Western countries are. Right? When Russia gets it, it's very different. They're much poorer. They're much more massive. When China gets it, it's like a, ma it's a humongous country. Right? Totally different system that they need. And they have a very different amount of wealth to begin with. Um, so is capitalism different in China than it is in America? Absolutely. Uh, is it still capitalism? Well, it's more complicated. Right? It's definitely taking a lot of elements of capitalism. You know, it's and it's but it's tweaking them and it's figuring them out in a new way. And it's I mean it's yeah. the most pure form of capitalism, I think, the Chinese way of doing it. Yeah. Everybody capitalized. Well here's and here's the thing that's really interesting is that um, when you look at like like how did America globalize and America really coupled um, it was the Cold War that was really key and they coupled military bases with um, this kind of media activity, right? And in China's case, it, it, it's, you're, I think what you're saying is bang on because it's almost purely investments, right? 50 years, we get this area and we build this bridge for you, yeah? Okay, just economics. They don't come in with military, right? They're not coming in with media mania. They don't come in and, you know, tell a billion stories. No, 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 just pure business deal, right? Um, so yeah, in that sense, yes. Have they kind of purified it or made it more capitalistic or something, yeah. Um, so this, what you bring up is an interesting thing. I mean, I, I think I'm, there's a limit to how much I think I can speak for China. So I, I'll limit that because I try and learn from China. But really, my background is I'm a white, well, I'm Jewish, white, Canadian, whatever the fuck, Danish too, yeah. But I'm certainly, you know, I, I certainly... And uh, yeah, I, I try and uh, learn and have, have, a, have a good dialogue. But, but for you guys, I think more than me, uh, especially if you're of Chinese descent and now you're in Singapore and what that history was, I think that's a really a key history to this, right? There's a lot of expat Chinese around the world. Why, right? What's going on? Do they want to return now? Is that like, what is the details of that? In Vancouver, there's a huge Chinese population. And one portion is people who want, who like something of Chinese culture, but don't like the political aspect of it. Other people are very pragmatic, and they're happy to return when it's practical, right? Um, there's a lot of reasons. So I think that, I think that perspective will be really interesting, because I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sort of American model that I, that really I grew up with, and I think is still the predominant model, but I think it's going to shift to a place like China. So this is really maybe the important question, is to start asking, what is the difference? What is their version of technology and capitalism? Because certainly there's a ton of capital in there, and there's a ton of techno, right? So, and, and, it, and I do think that certainly regionally, it's, it's very soon going to become the predominant model, if it isn't already, right? And globally, in a lot of ways, I think more and more, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's a question maybe for discussion that, we, that I can open up to you guys. Um, I'll give you a bit of this sort of background. So what, um, so we talked, this is a really good question because we got a bit of the meat of what that term could mean and what, what, it, what it means in the literature. And because you asked that, I'll just talk briefly about empiricism. Empiricism comes from a Greek word, empirea, which is just experience, basically. Yeah? So it's, and then when the, the Western European thinkers take it up, it's, it's this debate about what is good knowledge and where does it come from and the two basic schools which get synthesized in Immanuel Kant, or a German thinker, is the rationalist and the empiricist. And the basics of it is that good knowledge comes from rational thought, 
from logic and from structures that we sort of linguistically and hypothetically invent. And this is sort of Descartes does this. And then there's empiricism, which is sort of more of a British model, which is, you know, experience is sort of first. Yeah? So I'm just taking it up in the limited sense within science, a scientific idea, that experience is important and experiment is important. You don't necessarily need it for technologies, right? You can sort of create technologies. You don't need to stick with them and sort of empirically, you know, uh, 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 stay with them. And for me, both rationalism and empiricism play an important role. But basically, it's about, it's about talking about uh, exper experiential knowledge and knowledge that comes from you trying things and playing. And what the hackerspace does, I think, is at the center of this, yeah? Uh, it's kind of at the center of this as well, but I, I think what the hackerspace does is it sits between and potentially starts to open it up a little bit more towards experiment and less about just sort of getting the right commodity for that economy, right? Um, so, techno capital model, we can sort of say three things about the type of uh, the type of activity it has in relation to knowledge. It's product knowledge, yeah, uh, labs for things, and it's innovative, right? These are sort of basic tendencies within it. Whereas empirical model, you could say, instead of being product knowledge is experimental knowledge. You might not make a product out of it. And maybe here, it's more important that you make a thing than you fully understand the thing, right? Uh, it's labs for understanding. So it's about gaining uh, experience around this bamboo tree that we were talking about, as opposed to just creating a bamboo chair already and getting something else because we can't be sitting here, you know, understanding the life cycle of bamboo, right? Um, and the focus is really on reproducibility. And you might put in something like sustainability here, but I think of a robust sort of experimental model because you need to keep returning to it. Your focus really is on is it still true? Is it still true? Is it still true? Right? It's almost like when you apply maybe that creation somewhere. Right? Whereas here it's about innovation. Think of another thing. Okay, you created a chair, good for you. You know, I love you. Okay, make, make something else. Right? Otherwise, we don't have a business. We can't keep afloat. Right? Um, and or in the case of like university labs, think of a new way to spin your research so we can get another grant. Because if you're not doing that, then we're going to sink and die, right? And this is my love-hate relationship with the university science. Um, so yeah, so those are sort of three basic things we can sort of say to map out what these polls might look like. Yeah. Um, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to talk about because um, do you mind going back to slides to the techno capital versus empiricism? So I wanted to ask about the kind of base reducibility of those terms because you have brought up you know this kind of different schools of thought with regards to how it relates to a certain understanding of a product or understanding. Is there necessarily a tension that's kind of implied here? Because there's a kind of base crossover you kind of need to understand or rather you need to know the contextualization of that particular knowledge before you can start building. So when right. you said that there's a versus, especially when you brought up that point about, you know, making the bamboo basket versus having the molecular knowledge, right. is that necessarily so much a key core difference as much as just different levels of examining the same topic? So, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, and the, the funny thing is my example goes right along with your sort of self-contradicting potential of this because my, my example, really, the techno-capital person is probably the basket maker because he's making a practical thing for like his, his community. And then the empirical person is studying some gene that maybe doesn't lead to any useful thing at all, but he just wants to know about this weird molecular stuff, right? Um, and that is completely in contrast with my idea that somehow this more westernized model brings this, right? And, it, and it, it just drives your point home that these cross over in a million different ways and in so many ways. Um, my claim really at, at, at the core here is just that it's one useful framework to ground a way to think about what direction we might go, right? Um, yeah, it's absolutely not saying that these don't cross over like crazy, that I'm not, that they're not dependent on each other in a million different ways, um, and that maybe it's not the best framework, right? It's one that I found useful in starting to uh, get at where I think um, science can go. You know, when I think of what, what disenchanted me about the ivory tower, what were things that I found were lacking, what are thought models that can have, that can start, start discussions really, not solve them by any means, but start discussions that can start to get at some of those ideas. I, yeah. think, but I think for me also, maybe looking at science is where you look at, um, as, as science as a, as a, like nature as a resource maybe, like the idea that you do science, like for me the techno capital versus empiricism would be, like anything techno capital would be referring to looking at science as a money making, sort of model um, 
so and, and so for example for me like if the basket weaver was making it and then it was functional but it was also artistic then maybe you know like so for me I think maybe when I think about what you put up here and the empiricism and maybe it's more like you know maybe how why we're doing like the motivations for for the science yeah, 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 yeah. And then we flip it, and then the basket maker, it's about sort of this experience and so continuing it with the culture, me, whereas the molecule might be some for some yeah. technology eventually, maybe not yet, but that's the and idea. Maybe empiricism is more about like the learning and the, the journey <laughs> during science or the teaching, and what, and maybe, you know, then you could look at, you know, for me, that's how I, I, would, I, I, would use, I would look at those words. But yeah, I mean, there's mm. many different ways you can. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking of it a bit in that way, but then it's almost like, you know, sometimes as I'm talking, I real like I realized as you were saying that, I was like, because it kind of, when I, when I was talking about the basket before, I was like, oh yeah, like he's like skill, and I'm like, oh yeah, I like the basket, and I'm like, oh wait, that's exactly sort of flipping, <laughs> you know, um, but that, yeah, like you said, Adeline, that's exactly the sort of complexity of it, is that you'll find within this, you know, the, my, 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 my big thing is, is that I think that it's useful to look at this because the overriding tendency, you know, and the tendency that's beyond us to do anything in an immediate sphere. And I think that's where philosophy, where discourse becomes useful because maybe the things that we sort of live with uh, without having made explicit, um, what is the structure of that? What is the structure of how power is organized? If you're trying to do science and it's getting devalued or you're not fitting into a certain cog in the machine model and like what are the reasons for that? Um, this is one version of, uh, of a bunch of ideas that I think can lead to some uh, ability to talk about, you know, like, like what, what might be going on, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, you know, and, and the bottom line is that, you know, to offer a framework and then to have a discussion about, model, I th about a model of, of, say, knowledge, I think the, that very process will lead to new models. And I think that, that's another implicit sort of idea for me is just having that discussion, right? Like maker hacker movements or science labs or or within commerce. I mean, philosophy is just like what? What are you doing, right? And I think it's valuable. And in some way, I want to say, well, this is. However, you know, it's like, oh, but you can't prove any. There's no facts in philosophy. Or whatever. yes, but I think it's super useful. You know, maybe because of that. Maybe because it's continually about unearthing new perspectives. And you know, um, and I really think this is a key thing that we need. You know, not the right philosophies, but philosophy, something, discussion. Don't just make shit, you know? Like, let's actually fucking talk about it sometimes, you and know? I think also, I mean, it's about values, right? I mean, like, I think, if you, you know, I want to talk about model, and we're, we're going to talk about open science, right? Mm. And I think uh, it's, it's not about what you can prove or disprove, but really why, I mean, for me, like, why are we, why are we discussing open science or not? It, it's about, it's your value of why you do science, right? I mean, hmm. So, the, you, this, I don't know if it's like something to prove. I, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and like you saying that as a scientist is great because a lot of um, the like the, the discussion of like, do values have a place in science? Let's let's take a, a survey of hands. What do you guys think? Do values have a place in science? This is like one of these classical American media questions, you know, like. <laughs> No, and then you get fine when it's like, whatever, man, I just like search for stuff and I want to discover and like, no, I don't, you know, I'm not doing ethics, um, which is great. I mean, within that model, I think there actually is an ethics, you know, um, but what do you guys think? Do, do values have a place in science? Yes. Who thinks no? No, but that, but. That no, 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 but this is. I, of course I do, but Feynman's yeah. value is that so you, you do science to, to discover new things, right? Yeah. No, and that is a value, right? Yeah. I mean, um, it yeah. doesn't have to be good or bad, right? Yeah. It's not about whether science is good or bad. It's yeah. It's why you do it. Right. I, that, like, that's why I mean by value. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I mean, clearly, I think, like, we, we, I mean, yeah. so with the techno capital model, the value of science is that you do science to make money. Right. 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 Um, right. Do, do fun versus good for you fit in one of those? <laughs> fun versus good for you. What is you mean like having fun while you're doing science? Yeah, or yeah, instead I of mean, someone yeah. saying, no, science is good for you, or versus what, what science is good for you, like health-wise? <laughs> <laughs> it's just good for you. Science so, as an implicit moral value? Or? Yeah, it's not, does science have values? It's the only value. It's all values. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like better than like cornflakes, you know? Yeah. The fun, fun may just be, you know, it's just, it, we may not have that good, uh, we may not have that value in, in where you can quantify and just... Just doing it because it is pleasurable. Is fun good for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. The, 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 the hedonistic treadmill. Right. right. I mean, I think, so I think within this, 
um, well, a I, hedonistic I, treadmill. I want. Well, right, no, can you get these in yes. Singapore? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want. How much, how much <laughs> I think they just sell utilitarian treadmills in China, so I would love to, yeah. No, the hedonic treadmill, sorry. Hedonic treadmill, that's the... Just, yeah, that's, as, that's just as good. Same route, pleasure. Yeah, I'm in. Very, very, very fun and, and good for you, one of those ideas. Huh? Well, yeah, I mean... So that means that why you can find anything about the art or, or things like that, I mean... Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, the, the, keep bringing that up. I mean, I think, like, okay, one thing I can say is that those are other frameworks that will fit in different ways within this, right? I think you could put both of those on either side in different ways, right? Um, another thing is that I think they fit within, um, you know, like, like the whole, this is one thing about, you know, like the, it, the, the American kind of let's do DIY bio is about awesomeness and about how much awesomeness you can, like, extract from every moment and like, make it more awesome, you know? Fun. Yes, but it's. Yes, you do it because you, it's good for you. Is yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Okay. So. It, right. Some people will look up to you, and therefore you have more respect in the world. So, are you posing that then? Is you contrasting that with the the sort of fun North American model versus this yeah, sort of I, more? I would, I would say America has, has that good for you as well, isn't it? It's all, yeah. It's all in okay. Let's stick with one point, though. At least, at least we had a point there. Um, so no, if if we go with that for just a second, I think that. Um, I think, I think there's something to it. I think there's something to it because I think in China it's even more pronounced, right? It's, it's, it's a little bit less, it's, it's about shoulds, it's about uh, this, these are things we kind of need to do, you know? Um, whereas uh, in America often an entertainment value is enough, right? And I think this is a really key thing when we think about America's influence and cultural presence in the world. I mean, the military obviously plays a key role, but what's really key too, I think, is the entertainment kind of investment that's going on. If you look at like economically how America pairs with the world, a lot of things they're not even number one anymore and they're, you know, there's really a lot of competition. Okay, after the war they dominate most things because everyone gets decimated, every rich country gets decimated by the war, right? But 40 years, 50 years later, you know, Japan and Korea, like all these countries are growing all over the place. And the, right, and the one thing that's still dwarfing everyone is A, military investment, you add up the next 20 countries in the world and America's winning, and media industry, you know? It dwarfs every other country. So America's really, really invested in entertaining the world, in providing stories for the world, in um, having fun, right? There's a huge economy, and is Asia investing as much in that, proportionally speaking? Absolutely not, you know? And this is something that you, now the big debate, like you, I showed you that lab, it's, okay, made in China, okay, now innovated in China. This is a shift that China really is set on trying to, trying to make happen. Um, but, I mean, this is definitely something that will take time for other countries to really, because America really, really has a, a corner on the fund market, you know? Um, so, behind that, you know, like what's good for you, what's fun, who's fun, who's having fun, and for whom, and when, right? And at what expense, and these kinds of questions, right? Whose story, you know? Are you only having fun if you're watching Hollywood movies because other movies just don't have the budget and they're kind of boring and what I'm just going to watch. I know it's not cool. I don't care, right? I, I, these are better movies. Because there's, and they often are because there's more money and there's more attention, there's more consumer attention and these kinds of things, right? Um, so my way of answering that is to start to show how that can lead to other questions, right? The value one is also really great too because it can kind of fit on either one. You can have a business ethic. You can have a sort of lab ethic. Um, you can also hate both of them. You know, there's lots of people in Vancouver that just want to hug trees, right? They don't want either of these things, right? Um, that's not me. Um, but if I want to maintain friends there, I need to, you know, at least uh, respect that point of view. Um, and, uh, and, the, the, and also the, the, what, where I was getting at when you first said it, Adeline, is that the science value question is a really key question within science discourse. And I think your view is very progressive if you look at um, how, how scientific... Uh, um, the, the scientific economy, the scientific community has sort of evolved. There's been resistance to that, right? Science isn't about that, but what's behind that? Often there's other values that come with that, right? Like these ones, like you say, right? They're already having values, why not make them explicit? Um, and I don't even think you necessarily need to say, oh, well, you know, you're always, uh, like your, your hypotheses are always value-laden. This is one, uh, like, uh, Kuhnian way of putting it. There's one, one thinker that puts it this way. I think even without saying that, it's just, what do you want to do, right? Even the most scientific, pure scientific thinker in European history is fighting for, we should do experiment more, right? That's a value, right? When, when you have the, the enlightenment thinkers, you know, the, 
um, uh, French Enlightenment thinkers, they're saying, no, we should be valuing experiment and not the taboos of Christian culture because this is more important for us, right? There's a value right behind that, right? And when you have, oh, you know, you know, science isn't about values, it's just about doing proper science and so on, often you have a defender of sort of a big science model that has a whole institutional set of frameworks and maybe a salary and maybe some children or something behind that, right? Um, so they're implicitly defending maybe a technological model because that's the very context which they're coming, right? Um, yeah. So maybe bring it up later. Think about how that evolves maybe as we talk. Um, because they're, they're really good ways of intersecting, I think, with, uh, with the ideas that we can sort of engage with. And, you know, and what is at the root of all this, right? Over and over again, without sort of stating it, for me, what is at the root of expanding empiricism, moving to the empirical model, is the idea of intercultural engagement, right? You look at this, of course, you can also say that techno-capital is multicultural. Yes, absolutely it is. But if we're going to have... Um, what, what I hope I can sort of start to show now, I think you get much more of what, uh, what I'll, I'll go back to the idea of weak and strong multiculturalism, right? I think, for instance, in Canada, we have a multiculturalism that perhaps is a little bit more techno-capitalistic than I would like to think uh, it, it is empirical, something like this. This would be a way of framing it, yeah? Um, so it's a little bit more about bringing together people on business terms than on an actual cultural exchange that tries to negotiate between the cultures. No, usually it's the economically dominant culture will say what's up and then the other one will hopefully learn to adapt. And if they don't, they won't really be part of that multicultural conversation, right? So have your token festivals and food and stuff like that. That's what we want economically. Otherwise, whatever. Don't speak your language in public. Like we speak English here, you know? Um, so what are the concepts that I think bring about this multicultural kind of basis of a more empirical kind of space. This is what I'll um, propose in three different sort of categories. So uh, sustain a sustainable idea of science, and I'll just jump ahead for, for this. So multiculturalism as implied empiricism, yeah? And that's sort of where we're going to end up. Um, so as we get more multicultural, we get more empirical uh, with our knowledge. These are three different concepts we can explore as poles uh, from which to think about um, uh, how this knowledge is working, right? So we already talked about the first one, yeah? This is this uh, kind of Euro-historical kind of idea where the empirical and the rational are uh, the, the leading kind of terms and categories for people who are fighting for science, people whose value is we should experiment, we should do these things. I'm someone who is a, sort of a card-carrying member of something to do with this. Like I do agree with these things in, in some sort of a way, maybe not in how they've always evolved, or maybe some people might use the terms or misuse them in my opinion today. But in, in general terms, I'm interested in this, in not being anti-science and technology, but maybe being uh, critical of technology and trying to think about what we mean by science, something like this, right? And what, what a community space like this can sort of play in that, right? Um, now, the other two I'll talk a, a little bit about. Um, so let's go through. So first, um, what is the rational empirical? Um, we talked about what empiricism means, so it has an experimental uh, element. Um, uh, collective frameworks. So this means that when I come up with a framework, if I say, you know, this and this is true about the bamboo tree or something like that, and the guy who makes all those baskets says, well, actually, no, when I did this, um, this came out, so the third point that you made isn't really relevant, or you should talk about it in this way, maybe it'd be more helpful to someone who actually knows how to work with bamboo, which you don't. Um, if that collectivity isn't there in making the framework, then I think it falls apart, right? Um, and we, you can think back a bit about how, oh, well, if an economic factor is determining it, then maybe we're not meeting that, right? So the collective element to making a framework. Um, and when I say engagement in hypothetical engagement, who can make hypotheses? This is an important question, right? We know that hypotheses are things that will lead to experiments, right? But who can make them? You know, if that bamboo guy comes along to an MIT lab or whatever, you know, to Stanford and says, hey you know, National University of Singapore, I think you should be doing this in your research. And it's like, what is your, what, what are your, you don't have a bachelor's? Like what? <laughs> like, you know, you just walked over here, you read this in a paper or something and okay, great, you know? And even if they were like really sympathetic, there's nothing practical that would make them in any way uh, find a reason to engage, right? What would it mean to like, oh, they'd take them on and maybe they'd, they'd be some media charity case. Like there's no scenario in which this would actually happen, right? Because our political structure and our social structure is completely at odds with making that discussion um, 
uh, useful, right? Now, is it useful somewhere like here? I, I think so on some level. Can it improve? Yeah, sure. But I think in a space like this, you do have people with a science background. You do have people with kind of any background. And it's the beginning of a different kind of model, I think, right? Of what I'll talk about in a bit about uh, knowledge libraries, yeah? So we've got different spaces, community spaces, libraries. We've got spaces like hack spaces, maker spaces, that I think start to actually uh, provide a picture of what that might look like as opposed to university lab. Now, do we want specialists? Yes, I, I think we do in terms of making bridges or doing big projects. But when it comes to people's like environment and health and their food and things like this, no, I don't think so. I think we need this, this what I'm calling empirical. You know, we need a more interactive model. We need a multicultural model. Um, testability. So if, you, if something is truly testable, um, there needs to be, um, you know, it's like, like when China does an experiment and then, and then um, or, or publishes a paper and like the media, uh, China is a complicated country, but the media coverage of China is a whole other element in itself. The American media coverage is this whole, either it's this backward country that doesn't understand this and that, or it's this yellow peril that's going to take over everything with this evil totalitarian communism and anything they do by weird proxy is somehow devalidated uh, in that. They can't really do science. They can't really do this. Now it's more evil made in China kind of stuff. And there's a mythology behind it, right? Um, now, sometimes it's warranted. Sometimes it's maybe, you know, you can approach it from other points of view and so on. But how much is there a Chinese perspective in that, right? And we can reproduce this question for many, many other countries and, and sort of stories. And we can look at science journals then and start to ask this question. You know, we, we do a focus group. We do a statistical kind of generalization. What was the focus group? You know, it was like kind of affluent 20-something Berkeley kids, you know, generally white. Is that a good kind of sample group to extrapolate to the world? Maybe not, right? Maybe we can do better, right? And what are the voices to actually begin that? So independence in the testing, like can a totally different group that is not accountable, that actually has the independence to retest it and to say, no, we don't agree, does that even exist? And most of the time it does not within, well, within a lot of power structures, but within you know, the structure of capital and technology, um, in our case, um, that's, that's a factor that will lead to that not being there, right? Um, can they access it? Can they afford it? Can they um, you know, buy the things necessary to reproduce the tests? If they can't, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but we should really limit the amount of influence that it has, and we shouldn't be generalizing it for the people who can't access it on their own terms, you know, and be testing it. Uh, we certainly shouldn't call it good scientific knowledge on any sort of, you know, uh, in any sort of a testable way, because we can't actually begin to do those t testable, th those, those independent tests, right? Um, and can they reproduce it? So reproducibility is the only one out of these three that you'll see in the literature over and over again, right? But again, it's within this Berkeley context, right? It's the context of, OK, who are the people who can afford the equipment, right? We even look at something like the Fab Lab model, which is a great kind of space between maybe the institution and the maker hacker space. And yet, if you don't have that $100,000 to get that equipment, you're cut off, right? So this is access. Yeah, it's opening things up, but to a point, right? Um, now, if people want to actually, uh, in this science context, reproduce it, well, there's this economic limit, right? So reproducibility is discussed. This is one of the three things that you'll find discussed in the scientific literature, but within a, a micro context, I would say, right? Within this context of people that can afford it, what is the, what is the more thorough idea of reproducibility, right? You can go outside of that. Um, and responsibility, I was even thinking of saying like retestability or something. Um, the key to this is not so much the sort of moral value thing maybe, but the response element. Can they actually not just test it and, and actually have an independent perspective, but actually be able to respond to it, right? To actually critique it, right? And to, for there to be an open forum for that. Right? Okay, open science, open hardware, open technology. We have these ideals. We're, we're fighting for these ideals. Who can get the technology? Where is the technology? Right? Who, who cares about the technology? This is a key thing, too. Like, not everyone in the world cares about 3D printing. Right? Not everyone wants to do that. So it isn't necessarily a universal thing that we all need to kind of democratize and worry about. Right? Um, but who wants to eat decent food or live in an environment that's not poisoning their kids or friends' kids if they don't have kids? Right? Um, or uh, if they care about their friends' kids, too, that's important. Or um, <laughs> this is me like thinking a lot about me through that scenario. I'm like, can I apply myself to my example? Yeah. Um, I would care about my friends' kids, just for the record. Just I want, I want you guys to know. I would really care. I would really care. Um, 
and, and things in your immediate environment, things like this, so maybe the indoor environment where you live. You know? This, I think, absolutely has to, has to evolve to a better scientific model, a more uh, diversely inclusive uh, model. Uh, continued testing, you can test it. Can you conti will it continue to be true over time? Right? The radon levels in your building is okay now. Are they okay in a month? Or are they okay in half a year? Right? Uh, the, the air quality of uh, you know, the downtown portion of your city, you know, is that something you can have a continual monitor on and continually discuss in a way that you know, is, is sort of open to... So yes, we want to test it, we want to be able to test it, we want to have the access, all these things, right? But we want also these responses to be open, right? Continual sort of responses. Um, and democratic discussion. So this kind of rounds it out in that you can respond to it, you can talk about things, the discussion is open. and. The ideal of democracy, right? This is another one of the great, um, not evil communism, but open, free de de democracy, right? It's almost just like a political term to say, I like the states or something, right? Um, or Canada or any of these democratic nations that know, it's almost like if you're poor, it's really hard to be democratic, right? And that's where, I don't, I don't know if I agree at all with how we use democracy. There is an idea though, I think, that I do believe in with democracy outside of that, that is simply that um, you can strive to include uh, anyone who's subject to laws in the conversation about those, right? And I think most Western models are not that great. The voting model is almost completely meaningless, I think. By the time you get to the vote, you're choosing two things that to me, I'm most of the time, I'm like, I don't want either at all. Like, you know, and I wasn't involved in any other step, right? How do we do democracy? It's really hard. And I think we need a lot of structures that aren't democratic. But especially in a smaller group or as an ideal, and especially within science, I think it's an important element because it is about can this discussion include as many people as possible, which again for me means more cultural perspectives, more backgrounds, more context, more environmental context, medical context, which really do change the data, right? That focus group isn't just, oh, I don't want these rich people having it. No, but if you're not white and you come from a different environmental context, there are immunological things that will be different. You're microbiologically, you will be different. So the, the just impersonal scientific evidence won't be the same, right? This will change. Um, and so yeah, so then that becomes important. So then this is sort of the, um, the, the general uh, framework that I hinted at a little bit. Um, and I think now when we have community centers, they don't really include science and technology, but they have something about how to socially think about this. I think organizations like the UN that are supposedly multicultural but are politically like spineless or, you know, they don't really have a real global political presence. It's really nation states that are doing everything. Um, if there can be a way in which maybe treaties can evolve to these points where we have social organizations that aren't just, right now, a lot of amazing, the best things that are happening are coming from techno capital, are coming from these international kind of semi nonprofits that have some kind of a weird business model that we can't figure out if we're not like, you know, like a, have a business degree. Um, now, the, what is it? The, the moral social entrepreneur, social business or something? It's defined as a for profit because it gives you more freedom, but you can be even more like a non profit and bet. I don't know. I don't know. It's a, but it's trying to do these things using the model, which I think is great because that's the power structure we have, right? So a lot of the time, it's these kind of independent organizations that are doing things that governments are not, you know, and the UN's not. You know, the UN's like making a new UNESCO list, and it's like, okay, thanks. Thanks, UN. Um, applying it nowhere except for their website, you know. Um, and the thing is they don't have that sanctioning, whereas the corporations do. They have that sanctioning within nation states, and when they build up a legal presence in multiple, suddenly they're the new, they're the new global power, you know? It's this legal precedent that allows them, and if you've got, you know, like, I don't know, you think of, like, Nike, how many, how many states is it registered in? How many states, maybe, you know, there's like, now you look at the GDP of countries and you compare them to global corporations, and global corporations are, are like, exponentially gaining, right? the pie of many, many states at once, right? So this is an opportunity for dynamism, for gaining a platform, right? If I have these ideals and I want to engage, I'm becoming more and more aware of, this is like where we're talking about, do you want to use open this or that? And I think it's always a compromise between what people are actually using, where the public actually is, and then what you want to, what you want to fight for, right? It's like going to the Biosum is great because it's a great platform. At the same time, is it, are, there, are there things out of that that you want maybe as a Singaporean sort of scientist to reinvent in your own context or something like this, right? But suddenly you meet all these people by playing that game that you maybe wouldn't have, right? So I really, you know, it's not like, oh, fuck all techno capital, be good empiricists and fight the system. And so, no, no, you need to fight the system. You need to find ways of engaging in the system, right? Um, 
where do these libraries of knowledge come from? And I think it's very complicated. I do think that the, how the corporation evolves, whether it's the nonprofit or these new profits or whatever, they, they're going to play a big role. They're the only thing beginning to give a model. Uh, a lot of more um, active, like our, the, the group in Shanghai is a business, an education business that couples with some of the ideals of the Fab Lab and the maker movement. And it's given me, you know, like, like, like me going there and, and getting, getting, uh, getting all, all my, um, all my, uh, you know, doing all the paperwork and stuff, I'll have a platform I haven't had other places, you know, because they have backing and funding now for my open ideas and stuff coming from just a basic educational commercial model, right, that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So the strategies for this, I think, are complicated. I do think nation states need to play a role. I do think that, you know, these international organizations like the UN need to play a role. Um, Without question, one of the biggest practical roles will be played by corporations and how they evolved, because they really are the people defining this discourse more and more. And big institutions that are coupling with them, like Tongji in Shanghai, like you know MIT in Boston, like you know um, um, NUS here, right? Uh, how you partner with them and how you strategically engage with that. Um, it's not going to be governments alone, and governments aren't necessarily interested in, in the international community, anyways, right? Um, but these are sort of the uh, the, the, the basic idea. So if you have a community center, you have a library, and I use library in this way of sort of reinventing it, right? I think there's a lot of great things in the library. Is there such a thing as a global library of knowledge? You know, can we have that? Can we take the book model that I think is great, make it international, and make it about not just books, but other things that you can write and invent on culturally? Like we have videos, we have video games, we have all these things, and we have now the whole panoply of maker Things. We have 3D printers, we have laser, we have all these things. Can we think about how there can be a library of that kind of lab knowledge, you know? Goes beyond just maybe the theories that you can get out of books, right? Which I think the library kind of covers interestingly. And then, and then if you marry that with the hackerspace and the makerspace, I think they bring a lot of the model for how that would work, right? How do you bring in things? Well, I think that's kind of uh, there in a way when you look at hackerspaces. Um, is it about opposing technology? No, it's about demystifying it, right? It's about actually being more pro it and engaging with it more um, and finding ways in which that the diversity can engage um, in different ways. Um, so if we return back to this, these concepts, this is sort of the, um, oh yeah, that's just an extra slide. That's not supposed to be there. Um, this is kind of the, 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 the key underlying thing. Um, Multiculturalism as implied empiricism, not as, oh, how do we work in different cultures to maintain our purified empiricism? No, we don't have it until we engage in these perspectives and we find a way outside of, you know, a sort of more economic bubble to think about it. Um, yeah, that's it. And I mean, like now I would be interested in what you think, where does fun fit and where does good for you fit in this and where do values fit? Let's say if uh, I'm interested in science and I want to do a performance enhancing, you know, whatever, and I try to uh, experiment with amphetamines in the in the trailer. Yeah. Where do you stand on that? <laughs> Couldn't you do it in an ivory tower? Where it's like really expensive, and you're wearing a business suit. Um, it's got to be a trailer, you know. Do you guys know Trailer Park Boys? Do you get that in Singapore? Trailer Park Boys. I think it's on the internet, but, I, but we don't get it. All right. Our, so yeah. only intrepid, savvy researchers find it, right? It's Canadian. All right. You're welcome. You're welcome. You want to see North American trailer trash, the ultimate show. <laughs> we did it. We did it in Canada. Yeah. Not America. Not America. So. I love that show. But anyways, it's... What's that? Yeah, yeah. It, there's a lot of... What? American backdrops? No. No, no, no. Yeah. Nice backdrops. Nice backdrops. Of a ton of these trailers with guys inside of it testing amphetamines on themselves, right? Yeah. They, the trailer park boys are 100% for you in doing that. They'll be like, yeah, man, yeah, he wants to test them. Let him fucking, yeah. Well, okay, I'm just going to say that when I, when I say values, like, that is a value, right? I yeah. Mean, why, right? So, I mean, like, yeah. like, if you want to go and do that, I say, like, yeah, hey, you're going to hurt anyone, go ahead and do it. You know, that's right. what you ask me. So, that's my value. I'm just saying that, like, if we think about science and why, you know, and you and here you're clearly you're arguing for open science. Let's yeah, say yeah. That we, yeah. We no longer have any reason. We, I think in Singapore we don't know why we're. Well, sorry, take it back. Not that we don't know why we're doing science. We do science because we wanted to invest in it as an industry, as a whole tech and capital thing. Hmm. Maybe the um, philosophy so, could come yeah. in the the understanding of what it means uh, 
if I'm doing amphetamines, you know, the blue eyes, and then that impacts culture in that sense, or if I want to trade with them, the country with opium and tea, and that affects. And that, that's, that's a philosophical argument that you could put in science, isn't it? That's where science and philosophy... I, I, I don't yeah. But I even think, I even think like, like, like you implied, Adeline, I think even before you, I, when I say philosophy, I say in a very generic sense, just any idea you have. I think you already had a philosophy. Just when you said, I want to put amphetamines in me in a trailer, right? And that's why I brought up Trailer Park Boys, because you're a Trailer Park, park Boy. At heart, at heart, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In your heart, you're a Trailer Park Boy, shooting drugs and making them in your, in your trailer. Um, underwear, white underwear. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not a wife beater, but wearing a wife beater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The good version of that. You're not beating your wife, you're just sensitive and like putting amphetamines in you, but you're wearing a wife beater, yeah. You just can't be by your side and the bong <laughs> your pillow. That's, yeah, that's right. Your pillow is a bong, man. You're an open scientist, bro. You made it, you made it. Um, no, I mean, one immediate thing for me is that that is actually, so like I think of the quantified self thing, which fits in different layers. I think on the one hand, what you're talking about is a fight, a very literal fight today, which you could couple with what I'm saying pretty closely. Because the quantified self people and people, think, think for instance of pharmacology. 50 years ago, you would pretty much test any drug on yourself. Today, that is so overwrought with regulations and safety this and that, that, that you, you, it's unthinkable in most developed countries and developed labs. Yeah. Um, now, what do we think about that? Is that compromising our knowledge? Is that compromising the responsibility of the people that are putting these products out there? They don't have to test it on themselves. Does that change what's going on? Does that basic empirical kind of process also change the knowledge? You're, in a sense, implicitly fighting for not just the trailer park life, right, but also um, that self-testing is a, a, a crucial part of science. Historically speaking, it's almost always the baseline. Only in the last like half century has that become almost kind of an exception to this big statistical kind of technological model, you know. Um, and now you get this, the quantified self movement and stuff. I mean, you know, then there's also a, a, an element to that where there's like a whole app making community that create all these apps that monitor different stuff or the people who like write down exactly what they're eating all day and whatever, you know, like, so there's different versions of the sort of self-testing paradigm, right? Um, but yeah, no, and I think that gets right to the, right to the core of it, right? And the economic thing, I, one thing that I think of immediately is that when you're, I think a lot of the developing world is a lot more pragmatic and a lot more about good for you or good for economy or something like this, arguably, right? I think Singapore leads this charge, you know? Um, but I think your questions are quite different. You know, when you're in America or even Europe, as much as Europe is a sinking ship, it's still got, you know, centuries of privilege to, to, to drown under, you know. Um, the, the thing is, a lot of the people ask questions that are totally impractical. And I think it's almost like a new colonialism that we have this kind of value colonialism that they come and say, oh, you should be doing all these impossible things that will use up all your money. And then you won't be able to catch up at all with all the infrastructure that, ever, that we have when we come here, right? So I, I, I almost, you know, like one thing is, okay, if you didn't pass through industrialism, you need to pass through if you want to compete with tertiary economy. If you are behind in certain ways and you want to catch up, I think to find models to fault that is, the fault is on the side of the model maker, not on the person being overly practical, you know. Um, Asia is acutely, both e extremely intelligent and acutely aware of the global position that they want and that they have, you know. There are other, like Eastern Europe, I think they, they're aware they just don't care, right? They're just like, whatever, you know? We're shrinking, our economy's dying, that's cool, you know? There's, so, there's, there's some weird growth going on there and stuff now, but there, there's not nearly an applied kind of um, response, I think, arguably, than you get in other countries, like some Asian countries. Um, so, you know, again, going back to like, what, what can we, um, and I can say that because I'm, I'm Polish too. I can say that. Yeah, I can say that. I, I compliment the things I'm not, and then I, you know, I can critique Polacks because come on, you know. Poland's doing okay now, actually. Um, but yeah, they're, like, generally speaking, the Eastern Europe isn't exactly the leading a a economy of the future. Um, but, um, but to get back to what you were saying, I think that that needs to be added into the mix because, you know, it's not just, oh, you know, you're overly pragmatic. It's like, well, your choices are not the same, you know? And it's the same with China. People critique China in a lot of ways where they, they need to get to stage A to do stage B. And it's like, oh, they're not fun and open and whatever. Um, and maybe culturally, you know, I think it's obvious they're gonna be different than what America is as they gain more and more power. But at the same time, it's like, well, if you don't have money for good transit, you know, 
why are you making all these movies? And is that what you should be doing or something? Creating a better image for yourself. You know what I mean? Should Singapore be having more fun as opposed to being more practical when they're in a very complex economic environment? You know, well, I'll, I'll, yeah. to, to be as strong as you guys are within an environment where your neighbors are not strong, you know, like economically speaking, you can't just trade with Myanmar and you'll be fine. You know, you need to be very strategic about it. So your task is a lot more difficult, I think. But I mean, yeah, you, what do you think? What do you think from uh, Singapore's... Yeah, I, I actually have to run for a call, but I was going to say that, like, you know, in terms of, like, is there, okay? I actually think a lot of great signs. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot to I'm leaving. Great signs, great signs actually came about from people who just wanted to do shit for fun anyway, right? So, hmm. I, yeah, I mean, so I think... Uh, you know, it, it just when I when I say bad, I just like I just feel like we need to think a little deeper about like science, like what we th what we say about science is about education, it's about being, it's about why are we human beings and what we do on this. I mean, I think these things are actually tied to each other. So you know, like I think that's something that we seldom think about when we think about why what we're doing. Hmm. And it doesn't have to be so lofty. But I think that the people who set up spaces, the people who are trying to run like education, right. Like, like, like for example, like the open science model could easily become, it's it's great. Like science dem democratization in, in China can make you a lot of money because you have right. thousands of like not sorry, more than thousands, right? All these people who have, don't have access to universities, and then you sing to them like, hey, I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna teach you a little bit of molecular biology. Like people will just pay me like five bucks each. I mean, I'm just saying that like a lot of these things can be turned into something that's just about profit making. So if you right. to see. Right. Sort of intrinsic motivation, and then you get that good for you out of the way, and then fun will naturally take care of every everything else because pleasure of finding out, isn't it? The BBC. The, wow. Right. Yeah, I mean. intrinsic motivation, whereas other than you say from outside saying, look, uh, science is where you want to be because you know society respects you, good for society, mm. or. You know, uh, you can invent a thing and then you can earn a lot of money and then it's just sim simply boring, you know? It's just, <laughs> right. you don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, oh, you don't know the trailer park life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you haven't lived here. Oh, yeah. I got formaldehyde content in these walls that you don't even fucking dream about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let's, let's say, okay, let's, uh, so one, the one thing, um, uh, it's not fully true, but let's just assume it is. Uh, 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 science evolved from fun, right? Has all science then, as it's been applied, been good? No. Okay, that's pretty easy to respond. So that's a bit where you were going. So if you just focus on the fun, then will the values will know, right? Um, I don't think we always need the good for you and the values, but we keep hitting those walls. We need to decide if we want to be a trailer park boy and inject ourselves, or if we want to fight for limiting science and tabooing exploration, if we want to buy whatever at any time. You know what I mean? Like values are always these walls we hit. I think the fun oh, model. The value, could, I mean, the value could be I, I do science, but I'll make sure it doesn't hurt anybody. Saving right? I mean, the world. Or I stay in the fun realm, I stay in the play realm. Or like, there's a lot to be said for, and I think behind a bit what, why you're interested is because there's a value maybe. Like one, there's a value. There's a for, value. for me within a, a, ex, ex, experimentation, you could, another way of put it is, is focusing on play, right? Which might fit with what you're saying. So one time when I talked about this empirical thing, I focused, it was more for kids. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to talk about this. And I thought, well, if you play and you try things and you kind of stay in the playground or something, I think that's kind of similar, right? So then we'd be making a similar argument, saving right? Because we'd be saying if you cool. saving whales is fun. No, saving the whale or whales, whatever. Uh, okay. It's a little lame, it's very but okay. Yeah. Complicated yeah. human behaviors, you know, saving the whale and why they're going extinct, or even the climate and what's happening, and right. and how it's the the complexity involved and and the 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 little in you know the the, the sophistication in how things work. Um, yeah, and it's fun. It's fun, but when you put it, you, you you set the sort of environment expectations into no, you have to do that because that's good for you. you, know, you right, and then maybe that takes both going to the same objective but through different means, and that particular mean may be more harmful, or may maybe something that is easier to deal with, the good for you, but right wouldn't, wouldn't have that result of you know wouldn't have an open set of Thinkers. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the openness, yeah, the open, I think the openness to experiment, to fun, to play, 
our cousins, you know. I think there's a similar, do we want to let people in our society do that and come up with crazy things and stuff, you know. And I do think that that's behind an, an element of the experimental thing, right. Um, and not just the people with the, the techno capital and the money, right. But, like, have that as an open ethic. What were you going to? No, no, I was just wondering whether there is kind of a great uh, um, meaning to kind of this circling back to this fundamental definition of that very fuzzy term that we use as fun, which is a complex social, political, psychological <laughs> behavior and motivation that has so many of these factors, and a lot of which, if we want to consider the term fun now, has a lot of loaded American cultural imperialism implicit in it because mm. of their dominion of the media apparatus. And I'm just wondering whether there is something to be glimpsed from just continually kind of this sort of pedantry as opposed to, you know, having a great interrogation of the framework at hand. Because that's the thing that's informing whatever we think of the public moral code, whether it is the kind that's embedded into a greater framework of the knowledge economy or the knowledge production economy, or, you know, within practicing as a science itself. So I was just wondering whether there is, you know, so I think that's a question to you. Do you want do you want to have fun, or are you trying to indoctrinate us with American imperialism? <laughs> Trailer park, and now he's talking about fun all the time. Oh my maybe, God, man! Maybe, maybe Come so on. Fun could be like uh, a primitive sort of reaction where you go. Right. And have, you know, you want to eat no, but where's the distinction? I guess is right. Like you want to eat something. Yeah, you can eat sugar, fat, and whatever, and that's perfectly functional. Great. You know? mm. But you don't. You want to eat something that is that's a salad with olive oil and whatever on the salmon, which is good for you, but much more tasty than the, the practical, it's good for you kind of food. Hmm. Or soylent. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because I, what I think of in that context is the amount of, again, like how do you know, how do we know what to eat ever? And if you look at the history of that, that, that's an experimental field. Like, how do we know that this is good and not that? And we ate and we ate and we evolved cooking based on our senses, right? And now the most, yeah, well, no, and that, and that, and that transition is, is key because now it's like some kind of rational calculation or something. Anything that you feel, if you, if you, if you were lost in the forest and you're a survivor man and you're trying things and stuff, you would, you would start from ground zero for us because first you'd be like, wow, all I have is my senses, you know? So we've become totally non-empirical in that way, right? And your now this version of fun is a way of bringing it back. That you're, you know, like I was talking. I have this this in this lab. There's an Italian. And there's an American. And the American is a, a calculator eater. You know, he's like, oh, it has this thing and this thing, and this will go to this part of my body and this and it tastes gross, but and he feels bad after. But no, it's good. You know. And then the other guy's an Italian, and he just he's just like whatever. I just you know if it tastes good, and he cooks, and he like eats pasta, whatever, all these bad things, right? Um, what is the basis for which, you know, you're even determining that? And if pleasure is part of it, I think there's a lot of cases in which, yeah, you'll actually ground yourself a little bit better. One thing that pleasure absolutely so does... Quantifying, derive great pleasure from quantifying it, so you can't, you can't define what his pleasure is or, or that he's not. Important. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quantifying food is fun, man. Come on, Eric, come on. Stop, stop taking away my fun in quantifying food. It yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but, but if we look at, absolutely, 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 it works like that as well. But if you look at, um, if you say that the sensual pleasure you derive from food is related to the knowledge of the food, right, as opposed to the sensual pleasure you derive from mathematics in relation to food, or whatever you want to define the calculation part, um, if that's true, then there's a relation between what you're talking about and then again this experimental idea, right? Because whatever you think about pleasures, it's certainly related to something to do with your, your, your body and your senses and so on, right? Um, so it's one way of returning to the idea of, well, how do I know this food is good or not, right? Um, in an experimental way, um, yeah. Because what you're saying is absolutely true on the, on the level of fun. But in the, you know, and how it relates to sort of the experimental thing. You're going to say something? No, no, I was oh, okay. just wondering, you know, going back to that finding, foraging in the middle of nowhere with nothing but your senses. I mean, if you go back to the base, the roots of things, like perhaps some berries to taste is great. Okay, good. Something to eat, you just die. Like, that, that's the base reducibility of that kind of process. Right. It's that if anything happens, you just die. You don't affect anyone else. You just you know, kind of die and you decompose and maybe more things will grow from you and, and the cycle continues. 
I love that you went that far in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You decompose, bugs grow, and yeah. There's a certain population of people who have come up with a system, a system of recording that particular knowledge and cataloging it. And then you have science. You have, okay, I can't eat this berry because if I eat it, I'll become this man who died here. Right. Whom the berries now growing out of. The who, for whom I have to thank my beautiful trailer park garden. Yes. Right? Yeah. But yeah, but instead of weed, you grow mushrooms or something. Right. Ooh, and, yeah. So it's a much needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but I mean, and so then, then you and in your example, the, 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 the person who died to become a garden liked the berry, right? So pleasure is in everything with just because then you died, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, you, how do you know? You know because it happened and you witnessed it. And then if the person who died witnessed it, it doesn't matter because he's dead or she. You know, women can die just as well as men. Um, and uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Equal opportunity to, to die by eating shitty berries. Um, and, uh, and then it's the person next to that. You know, if no one witnessed it, right? If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around, you know. Maybe it happened, but we didn't learn that trees can fall. You know, that's the that's a variation I've never done on that. So, but what, what is, so in, in your open space, let's say, yeah. uh, someone or a group of, uh, of, of scientists or enthusiasts thinks that the world is six thousand years old and adamant of that fact. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how, how would you go about the? the Having a system of democracy in that in that sense, and maybe the other portion of another group is 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 angry. Yeah, 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 right. Where they get killed off or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they make a garden out of them, right? Put them in their trailer park. Yeah, use them as a source to inject into themselves to prove that the world is six thousand years old. Um, I think so. There's two things I will say to that. One is that I think in terms of. Uh, um, in terms of the objective truth, which I do believe in on, 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 on a certain level, um, that will be a bad model. And that's, I think, where you're getting at, right? Um, that uh, this is not, I think there's a value of big science. I think there's a value for hierarchizing knowledge. And I think it's in the case of this. Like, if we want to build a bridge, we don't want to democratize all the opinions on how to build the bridge. We don't want to have everyone's cultural opinion on how they feel with their linguistic background, on how bridges should look. No, no, no. We want people who have learned how to fucking build bridges, right? So we want hierarchy. We want professionals. We want ivory towers. We want a few people who really know what they're doing. And we want to segment that, right? So this, this is when, when socially it's something that, that is not, um, and this is debatable where this begins and ends, but it's not impinging on people's personal lives and limitations, well, what right? Those people but are the top? Who, what, what, what? The 6,000-year-old. Yeah, the, 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 the okay, well, that's another version. Okay, let me get to that. I'll do that spin on it. I'll do that spin on it, okay? But let me finish this one, okay? Um, let's assume that there, are, there is one smart person in the world that's not, one of these, because if everyone's a 6,000 year, then it's moot because everyone's that and nobody cares anymore because they killed all of us, right? Um, well, I don't want to exclude anyone from being a, a 6,000 year uh, defender. I think that's cool. Um, well, cool, you know, yeah, cool, like trailer park cool, right? Um, so, but no, assuming that, so we, we have certain ways of doing things, right? Now, as soon as, again, when it gets to uh, people's personal freedoms, their choice of religion, right? Their choice of, like, they want to live in a certain place, not just because of the, the, the science behind it, the environment, the food, and so on, but because of their own cultural decisions. Like, they want to live around people that believe that the world is 6,000 years. Okay, but then there needs, there's a point where this is not impinging on that. You just don't want to fall in the river on the bridge, right? And here we need hierarchical big knowledge. We need a big team to do this because one person can't do it. We can't turn it into a citizen science thing. Um, and there's many, many examples of civic projects and technological projects that I think fit into that, where I would defend big science and not some citizen science model. Now, when it comes to that food and that environment and so on, I think the, the, the extension of what you're saying is I would just say that, yeah, I would just, within that community, that's, those are real possibilities. But if they're basing their own communal lives on that and the food they eat, I would rather, there was, there's like a classic debate within bioethics on uh, like Mormons who are in a hospital who don't want to do a procedure because of their Mormon background. And I defended as you know, a medical researcher, the Mormon perspective. Not because I agree with them, not because I would do that, not because I think we should ever generalize that. But based on, it's like, 
I would defend you, as Adeline bravely did, uh, injecting yourself with methamphetamines in your trailer park, right? Not because I want to go to a trailer park and inject myself with methamphetamines, but because you... I'm, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. I didn't at the beginning of this talk, but now, I don't know. It seems kind of cool. Um, but you obviously are into it, right? <laughs> no, I mean, you, you've said you want to, and I'm like, well, yeah, if that's what you want to do. And it's the same thing for me with Mormons or with the 6,000-year people. If within their community that's what they want to do, ultimately I do still, um, you know, I still have a bias in my view, and for me to generalize that, yeah. So that would be same thing. I would say the same thing. Well, Absolutely. Well, it's not hurting anyone else, right? I'm assuming that it's you. Okay. Well, so then, right. And then, okay, so let's take a, so most vaccines actually, the, and this is, uh, this is one of the things I did medical research in. We developed adjuvants for new vaccines. Um, the, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter, the science behind that is by and large, their critical mass is far below anything that's even close to being threatened. Now, there are a few substances that are in the 90s in their percentile needed in order to be effective, right? The M- vast majority are at like 70, 60, 50 percent. We're far beyond. We can have all the anti-vaxxers we want and we're not even close to that being a threat, right? Um, and in that case, I would definitely say do not because there's a lot of valid critiques. There's a lot of scientific critiques about the way we're standardizing, the excipients we're putting in, the toxicity, and so on. These are important things. We need to do the robust scientific picture again, right? Um, do you think but the state should step in. The so so but so the 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 example. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know. But that example. Okay. So let's take one that is 95 percent that needs that, and that people are. Um, uh, that that that's a that's a tense moment where I don't know yeah maybe I mean the thing is now if you if you took the 6,000 person model on that level you've got a Christian community because I mean I think the multicultural thing alone will devalidate that how many non-Christians believe that the world that aren't like even Christians like most Christians ever have it's like the subpopulation of like American Christians that was like a guy from like 150 years ago this is not a Orthodox Christianity at all the 6,000 year thing right it's very recent there's tons of Christian philosophers through history, Christ- scientists who are working in 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 um, in a in a monastery and stuff like that. The the source of science is so much to do with with Christians with extra time on their hands and so on, just as it was in the Islamic world where science was really developed and it was also believers in Islam, you know, that did that. Um, but let's say you have that six thousand person thing, right? And you, um, I mean, to, to 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 flip it around, do you think that the that a state should not tolerate that, that people should not be able to, because I think, I don't know, the, 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 I, I guess, the, 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 what, what do you guys think? I don't know. I, I guess when you get to a point where um, the social group and the individual is at odds, then it's a question, it's a social question for that group, you, right? If the state is that social group, okay, but if the state is stepping in like some states do for minority groups, that's a lot different, right? I don't think they should. But if it's that minority group with autonomous um, governmentality, then, you know, that's, that's an internal what debate. What if a religious leader, top of the state, says that the world is flat, I would execute anyone who thinks otherwise? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Open science, come on, yeah. No, 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 this is, no, no, yeah, 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 no, 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 we're, we're, we're good, we're good, we're good, we, I, that's, that's, yeah, okay. we're, we're back to, yeah, 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 multi, we're, we're, we're exchanging knowledge, yeah, 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 no, no, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, each of your examples, I'll say this, and this is a bit like your response to what you're saying, I think, underlying a lot of them are a media proposition that has been put forward that I, don't, I think a lot of times isn't even a real proposition. Like, it's another one you could bring up is anti-GMO, GMO, or, like, I don't think the vax, anti-vax is a real scientific debate. I think any scientist who's actually working in the field knows that as you standardize and you try to globalize these models, you need to do, like, there's all these different um, uh, preservatives and additives that have been put in that haven't had good testing on them, the few researchers who are doing that, who aren't part of the techno-capital model, don't get funding. I know one of them personally at UBC, you know, and he doesn't get any media coverage because the media doesn't know what to do with him because he's a scientist who's scientifically looking at the vaccines, you know, and I was part of making these and, you know, I mean, like, we just, we didn't do any of those, that testing. We met the bar for what's required from this and that body and if that body doesn't exist, then we don't give a crap. I worked in environmental health, you know, and I ticked boxes for corporations who wanted to meet government requirements. 
And like the vast majority of chemicals they were working with didn't have requirements, didn't have good scientific testing done on them. You know, this is, there's, there's a whole realm that deflates the entire false binary that's put forward by the media, you know. Um, and I think that open science is an important part of that. You know, and having anti-vaxxers and vaxxers all together in a room and talking about, well, what is the problem? Well, my kid went through this, and this is all the, oh, this is the whole story that is just getting bracketed out because they're like, well, that couldn't happen. Well, it did, you know? And if you're not taking that into account, then you're a shit scientist, you know? You're a bureaucrat who wants to keep their medical job, and you're using the power of that position to just silence this voice. That is the, the anti-science in, in its most basic definition. What? Well, if you go to, if you go hang out in, in in Peru with the Indians there, before they hunt, they sit in the trees and they eat the leaves, oh, the process, coca leaf. Yeah, but even I mean, if you go to the dentist, you get cocaine. All the all the yeah yeah all your all your all benzocaine, lidocaine, they're all types of cocaine. Um, and cocaine started out medically as a topical. Uh, it was a topical anesthetic. Um, and and these these versions of it are still to this day when you get like your 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 benzocaine or lidocaine those are uh, um, and and I mean yeah so so try you know here's the thing like for me and it's never another false uh, binary is this idea that oh well it's synthetic so we need to do natural 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 like your berry example there's a lot of natural shit that isn't so good for you right like berries that taste wonderful that are a lot of fun and then you die and become a trailer park garden right and nobody wants that. Right? Most people don't want that, yeah. Do you want? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After methamphetamines, I die, become a garden, why not? Um, all right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, wait, where am I going? Adeline, you said I'm going to your uncle's? Do you want her back? Yeah, you gotta get her. Because I, I want a bed. I love you guys, but I want to know that. You want to convey a question? This is for the internet, yeah. Long live communication yeah. science. Just email her. how you speak. I go out of context. I go out of context. So you will figure things out. No, 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 but, okay. <laughs> I didn't even get like the one line. Okay, ninth, ninth, then. It feels later. It's okay, Singapore's a small place. You can get from point A to point B in at, at most two hours. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> On public transport. Yeah. But yeah. You do have to know where point B is. <laughs> this is my point. This guy understands me. This is open science, you see? You get part and then it fill it gets filled in. Yeah, it gets filled in. Um yeah, what were we talking about? Um so what if yeah. six thousand year old people are so, at the top? Yeah. So your, your knowledge that change are all get towards so again, the six thousand thing again. With I would put, it, I, I think the 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 first a really important point in that is how it fits into the American media debate. I don't think there's any other Christian group in history where that's actually a real debate at all. But that, that's an example. Right, yeah. but but I mean, I, it's an example. Um, but now the many examples, which are all, I think that's an important part to to think about. That this is these are faux problems created by techno capitalism ultimately by this cultural system of of creating media kind of debates. You know. Um, so they're not real problems because I think very quickly you get a group that's intercultural at all and th that won't be a discussion at all whether the earth is 6,000 years old, you know. Um, the model of total control too is one that, I mean, this, I, like open science, I don't know, it doesn't really have, you know, if you have a concentration of control within a group that already becomes a problem, right? Um, this, this is exactly what open science wants to combat is this kind of a, a situation. The, you think? That they, they don't know. That's like a Russell, but Russell's, Russell's got this quote where he, where he's it's something like, and I'm getting it wrong, but that all the people in power are stupid. <laughs> something like this. Um, the people who gain political power are stupid and know exactly what they're doing and talking about all the time. And the people with wisdom don't have any power and they never know what they're doing or talking about. If he's right, then it's not the case, right? That actually the people who don't know, I mean, um, depending on which one, the people who pretend they know. Because they cast doubt on you. You need to act in politics, right? You need to, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the open ideals, I think, is that if you keep opening up the conversation, then the 6,000 problem and the totalitarian problem and a lot of the things you're talking about will eventually dissolve with information because you'll get more, you'll get a perspective eventually that dissolves a pseudo problem, right? I think the media broadcast system creates a lot of the pseudo problems because it's a one-way conversation, right? America creates all these industries that, that broadcast this and then people debate these problems because that's what arrives on their, on their doorstep, right? Whereas I think if you had a community arguing about whether the earth was 6,000 thousand years old, there's a million things I could think of that would right away just dissolve that as a, as a real issue. There's so many different archaeological, natural, different things you can start to talk about that it would just, okay, you know. Um, and you'd need these really hardcore philosophical arguments of you're imagining everything, like Elon Musk that we're in a simulation. He's giving the ultimate, ultimate Christian argument, you know, it's like the 6,000 year argument, because if everything's a simulation, then we don't know anything, and you know, it's like, okay, great. Do you great. think that the, the best so-called best model of knowledge exchange. You have a, you have Multiculturalism and open science, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think I, yeah, I, th I think, th I think implicit in that is that I think no, there's not. But I think the more perspectives that you have, then, um, and the less you have of these like recursive kind of micro communities, you know, with the six thousand years and stuff, the closer we get to. I don't know. On the one hand, we have functional knowledge where we're building things with big science and or bu building pyramids or whatever, and then we have a kind of cultural knowledge. It's it's more sustainable within that group, right? In that group's you environment. You don't touch stem cells research because right. you, know, you don't want to be all of Europe, you know, or like I mean, with GMOs, sorry, not stem cells, but America was doing that for a long time, right? Until uh, what is it now? Obama changed that or something? Yeah, that's the guy that yeah. popped, isn't it? He said. Yeah, yeah, okay, but all of these, but is, is, is America an example of open science? No, right. I think it's, I think it's one of the best, uh, more open than I think, of, right, I think. At least leading the world at, in the top five, except maybe not. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think they are, I, I actually largely agree, but I think because they're in a position of having the freedom to have these communities and these people with, you know, MIT for all its technology and capitalism is also one of the freest places to go and study because it's on top of the heap. So it can make these lateral decisions, right? Um, yeah, but at the core of that, you know, what, what, what is the model for what's going on? I mean, honestly, for me, China is way more open than what I found in Canada because it's growing so much and people are so interested in new things. In Canada, it's just like, oh my God, there's just this burden of all these things that you need to consider and by the time you do you don't even have a consumer population and you're just hoping to create a little franchise that america will buy out and you know um growth and growth is very slow in the developed world and so openness in a certain frame is very you know limited i don't want to limit your next question but does anyone else have any other any any comments or questions <laughs> um Yeah, so how many people are part of the hack space here? Two. Two. The rest are like, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. And, but, but, but uh, return guests, some of them? Sorry, people you've seen before? No, I've seen literally members of the public I never met before. Are you, uh, are you guys? Now we've met. Yeah, now we've met. So you're all first time? Yeah? First time, yeah. No, you're not. Um, but so not too many, right? Not too many, anyways. So that, that illustrates my point. Um, we, I mean, we have like a meetup group that has, I think, now I don't know, hundreds of members. Um, we have a board that has maybe seven or something right now, and then actual paying members. We've got um, maybe 30, 20, 30 paid members. Paid members, yeah. Subscriptions. Subscriptions. Yeah. You guys have this model. Yeah. Paid. How many people? I think about like 40. Okay. Yeah. So, but then how many of those people regularly show up? Uh, maybe like 10. 10 it's like Kickstarter participation or something. It's like at one, one day they were interested, you know? And then, yeah, yeah. And, and like, like one day a year they wanted to be part of it, you know? It was enough to say, okay, and they don't, they're enough to not cancel the subscription or something. Um, like the gym. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Except I hope those people aren't like b believers in Gold Gym's like Gold's Gym's program or something like that. You know, 
Right. No, I'd like to think that some of those people don't cancel because they're like, this is cool, even though I don't have time or something like that, right? Or it could just be that they don't get around to it, right? Yeah. I certainly have memberships like that. Um, yeah, but those numbers are pretty, pretty. I think, common and and uh, representative of what's what's going on there. Uh, and even a little less, I would say, with the bio thing, because the the it's it's newer. You get more novelty kind of arrivals, but less people sticking around because there is a difficulty in 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 scaling up both economically and in terms of ideas. Um, science is just more, and it has less of maybe less of the fun, less of the results. Um, and um, so yeah, but I think it's similar, and biology will grow, but in a different way from technology because it just doesn't scale the same. It's more complicated, it scales slower. So the members reveal pretty much the bulk of our model. I don't know what you do here, but we also throw in some courses into that. And we've gotten small grants, and hopefully that will increase over time. Um, my idea is to, I think as I'm developing, I'm developing, so one thing I'm doing in this, in this kind of traveling open science thing is I'm developing kind of modules that can be very small and do like a maker fair in Manila and then also can be added together to create some kind of a community course thing or something, which I was already starting to put together in Vancouver and now I've put together more and then like I was saying in Shanghai, they're really interested in this sort of thing so I'm really going to get a space to sort of develop that and that's going to be something that I'm, I'm going to try and feed back to Vancouver, feed other places that I go um, and uh, that can become another model, not just the courses themselves growing but then you could have kits within the courses or something. Um, and like open hardware kits or something like this. So that's something we don't do now, but I can see as a potential. Certainly other spaces do that a little bit. For you guys, what is the, what are the what's the bulk of it? Membership? Yeah, primary membership. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for like courses, you know, you know, if uh, someone does a course here, it's free, so it's fine. But for somebody who charges money, then I think we'll just take a cut. Like by 10% or 15% of the, the course fees. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but if they say event is free, like today's event, yeah, then no problem. Okay. But we have that primarily not to make money, but more to make sure that the venue doesn't get abused for you know, maybe money making. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, your goal in that is really to stay afloat and keep some values and not, like, because you're not really trying to create a robust business model or something, right? No, the idea is to like create a. To make sure you can swim. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's similar in Open Science Network. And I guess, you know, I'm in China and other places, I've learned a bit, maybe maybe what we want to go for is a little bit more of a business model so we can engage more in these things that we've brought up in a million different ways so that we can have more of that freedom that America has and that other places. Be. Why? Because they, they play the business game a little bit more. Um, I keep changing my opinion on this because I think there are really important values to keep and you want these open spaces. Um, but there are just ways in which you get platforms and you get sort of power and a voice and you give other people a voice, you know, and how can we be strategic about coupling those, you know. Uh, we've had, I think, pretty similar models to what uh, Luther's talking about, and that is the stay afloat model, right. We, we, we're still there, we'll, we'll hopefully still be there, um, but we're not really creating something that will help us grow and I mean, there's a lot of spaces that when they do that, then they turn into something totally different and then they're not really the open space anymore, right? And I mean, maybe that's what they want to do okay. That's certainly what, not what we want to do. But I think if we were coupled a little bit with a little bit more productive kind of things, then maybe we could, we could expand a bit more and provide more stuff that would be free or would be, you know, um, yeah. So that's, I, I, you know, the, it's an interesting question. I've now traveled to about... Um, Ah, 20 or something. There's, I don't know how many bio labs there are in the world in this style, maybe 30 something, not too many, right? Um, and I've traveled maybe to half or something at this point. I'm always, I always press them on this. I'm always interested in how, how are you doing this? How do you stay afloat? Um, hack spaces in general, but then again with the science and the bio, just to start, you need all this equipment. And this is actually something in the details, what, one thing that I've really added to 
um, the, the, the MIT model or the Fab Lab model is that you sort of like a, a genetic transformation or putting genes in another organism is sort of your one on one, right? This is your equivalent to maybe doing a Hello World program or doing, you know, like a, the, the boat in a 3D printer or something like this, right? And to me, that the, the barrier to enter that is so much higher, I think, than these other ones that maybe it's not the best one because if you flip it around, you actually see that in this bamboo basket maker and a lot of folk knowledge and a lot of basic materials before the 20th century are pretty much all biological engagements, you know, and there's a real, before we start drilling for oil and making all these plastics and, you know, and creating this, this very, um, not non-biological, it still is biological, but it's pretty inhuman in that it goes to spaces that, that have been where we can't survive for a long time. Because it's organisms under the ground that, that, that are the fossil fuels, but they've been in a very weird environment for a long time. So the products that come out of that are really interact very weirdly with biological worlds, right? So it's a biology that's been mutated by pressure and heat and, and gravity and stuff like this. Um, and uh, so, but when we return to that eye level, you know, kind of material world, it's, it's, it's an ecosphere, it's biology, you know. So a lot of these basic kind of ephemeral, more ephemeral technologies are these engagements and uh, people cooking, you know, people um, learning how to just make basic things when they don't have the money to build, they just want to, they build a wood thing, you know, it's a really common material or they'll use what's around them, you know, they have a forest around them. Um, coconuts, coconuts are used all over the place in really interesting ways in places that have the coconuts, right? Um, so that those two things I've kind of, I'm kind of trying to marry and when I go when I went to Manila I developed things I could do it wasn't just this DIY stuff because I don't often know all the local flora and fauna but it was also what can I get at the corner store for really cheap you know so yeah I can, I can get you can get some pretty interesting chemicals and do some interesting stuff but you need to kind of do this weird consumer kind of research and research what is accessible in the market, what has become so popular that it's very cheap, right? And those things combined with trying to slowly build up the equipment in as cheap a way as possible to do the higher level stuff, which the DIY bio community has done great at, because it's not just can we do the transformation, but how can we rebuild all the equipment for maybe uh, $2,000, $3,000 or something as opposed to, you know, hundreds of thousands as it might cost if you order from a lab, you know? Um, and that's something, right? And that's something I definitely strive for, but that's an investment over time, right? Um, similar to building a hack space, maybe a little bit higher barrier, but it's like if you've got a space and a community and you're committed to half a year, year like we, we have been here, then yeah, you can slowly build that up, right? Um, and you can take that elsewhere, but it's not really something that I can take, even if I had all the equipment, three pieces of equipment to do some experiment, to explain, to really explain all the concepts in a way that would work at like a maker fair. You know, I can, I can do a DNA extraction. I can do a quick transfer. I can show one element of that, right? Um, so you very quickly start working in a different space with bio where you're talking more about concepts or principles or here's one part of this, you know, this kind of thing. And again, it lacks a bit of that sort of wow factor that, oh yeah, I'm going to join and I can do that tomorrow. No, you kind of like, you can do that over time. But going back to the, the simpler model, something like a bioplastic, I've actually developed a lot of techniques now that I can, you can do it pretty quickly and easily and Maybe it's not the best, you know, to sort of, but it's the beginning, and you understand some of the principles, you know, um, and uh, maybe working with, you know, biofuel or bioelectricity, or you know, and understanding the concept. I think it's something you can do uh, pretty quickly um, with common materials and stuff like that. Yeah. How many members are the Open or the Shanghai? So the Shanghai lab, and actually, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll what I'll do. So I kind of. Um, this is the, the, the bio build lab on the, on the right, right? So this is where I am now. And I, I don't know if, if you guys use WeChat or not, but feel free to, if you want to follow. Now I've sort of been given domain over this. So I'm trying to bring in, FabLab's model really is a coarse commercial model. He's taken, FabLab's already are semi-commercial or pre-incubators or something. But what I started to do is to create these community events. And if you guys are interested in, um, you know, st stuff to do with science and we start a conversation or you, you observe what's going on and you're interested in us interfacing, maybe I come back with something more extensive, right? I can I maybe do a little bit of a workshop series or something. Or maybe you guys are coming to Shanghai for some reason or you're, you know, interested in anything at all, right? What I've tried to bring is some element of this, basically. 
So I did a free event two weeks ago. I don't even, I haven't even heard of another free event that they're doing, but people want it because they know the Fab Lab's there. And some people have talked to me a bit about how Jeff, the head guy, doesn't really do that. He's more concerned about how to run a business, which I've conversely learned a lot from because he's actually got these resources now that I never had at the Open Science Network, right? Um, so between those two, we've got what you might call an equivalent of a member, right? So. Um, we've got people who are following, who are coming out as guests, more or less, to these things I'm starting to build. I'm trying to build uh, a new kind of community. Then we've got people who take the classes and stuff like that. I don't think they're members. We don't even have any members at all, really, in a classic sense, because how the, the lab uh, there is running is from education. And the bulk of it is school education. So there's all these rich parents in China who want their kid to have an edge and stuff like that. And if they're in elementary school or they're in high school or whatever, they'll pay, they'll pay a good amount. And you know the Fab Academy course thing, you know, it's like $5,000, right? So um, that all the Fab Labs sort of have that as a baseline, that they have the equipment to do that potentially, and that they'll potentially participate. Now, all, not all of them do, but that's kind of the unspoken kind of connection, right, or one of them. And then a lot of them create what's these Fab Academy Xs and these variations on it, right? Uh, and our uh, Jeff has done that even another level. He's created this whole Fab O Academy thing that even extends it even further. But the basic model, he's tweaked in all these different ways. So it really is a model about getting the good markets behind uh, uh, science education and tech education and using that as the main focus, you know. What tools or materials do you have in the lab? In the lab. Okay, so the, the BioBuild lab that you see here is... Um, Nothing. <laughs> I've, what? Currently nothing. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, currently. Yeah, you're currently a very small amount that I've managed to build in, in a couple months. And yeah, yeah, we'll have stuff. Um, but how I'm going to do that will be complicated because there's, so there's one, on the one hand, it was just, it was a trailer park. You know, it was just like an empty room, more or less. And it's like, this is the bio lab. And I'm like, no, this is a, this is a room. Um, and I've been thinking about how to do that. Well, one's the DIY method that I'm talking about, right? But the other thing is that because of the, all these resources and stuff, we're partnering with different institutions and building other labs that are actually really well funded. So right now there's this other place in Shanghai called Shanghai Tech, and they've got all these funds for this lab where I'm able to order a really high-level, expensive kind of things. And then the, what I'm going to do is find ways of feeding that back into the lab. So the ground-up method that every lab can and you know can do and then I'm gonna find ways of the other method that I did in Vancouver was I connected with as many science labs as I could and my time in U UBC was all about that I realized pretty after after a bit that I didn't want to do stick with the full traditional science academic thing but what I did want to do was to do to do some of that research and to create that network so that I could create an open lab that had access to a lot of that so I created a network of people that knew I wanted old equipment when they would get new equipment and stuff like that this is really key for the bio lab um, so the quick equivalent of that here is that I'm actually going to have a lab that I'm involved in myself, but hopefully over time too I'll be connecting with more people. So when I need a really, often labs will order way more than they want and to get rid of a little is, is, is not, but to order it at all, the companies will only sell, it's almost like B2B or something, you know, they'll only sell when they know they're selling to a place that will use a certain amount over time and, you know, um, that's tied to an institution. Um, like why bother with the 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 dude in a trailer park sort of uh, thing? That's part of it. There is also a bit of a um, a logistical thing behind. Uh, different countries are very different on this. On, I mean, Taobao sells some things that I, I are a real pain to get almost anywhere else on the planet, and there it's just like you just order it. Um, yeah. So a lot of it's the same as I think what Luther's dealing with, but there's I guess a a, a material addition to that. I would say, you know, and knowledge addition, yeah, that make it a little bit more uh, complicated. But as you can see, for me, I kind of conflate them. I, I think that they kind of can feed into each other, you know, because like to learn technologies is a similar thing and to extend that, like what about learning about the materials? This is what I do in the fab level. I help learning about the materials. So if you're using wood, or like what if we actually wanted to grow that or we wanted to, oh, there's got to be, there's got to be. There's got to be. I, I would predict that, that there's like a few. Um, it could be something you, you might want to Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. 
government is, is very uh, enthusiastic with funding. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I don't want to. Yeah. Sorry. Oops. Oops. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I don't know how to I Mac. I just yeah. I don't know what to. I know. I know my PowerPoint is somewhere here. Okay, yeah, I think it's getting late, right? No, I, I think you guys say you guys uh, have any questions you can engage, uh, Eric, Eric? Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. you for your time, guys, tonight. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if you're curious about